Welcome to the 2014 Journal of Experimental Biology Symposium held in March in Banff, Canada, where 18 international speakers were invited to discuss epigenetics in comparative physiology. Each speaker will also write a review inspired by their talk and discussions which will be published in a special issue of the journal dedicated to epigenetics in comparative physiology in early 2015. Hans Hoppeler, you're editor-in-chief of the Journal of Experimental Biology. Why did you choose the topic of epigenetics for this year's JEB Symposium? Uh, epigenetics is a, a field that has uh, been growing massively in, uh, over the co uh, past co couple of years. And uh, we realize that it has uh, important implications for comparative physiology. But so far, comparative physiology has not picked up too much of it. And so we really wanted to bring this field and its possibilities to uh, our community. Catherine Rankin, you were involved in putting together the speaker list for this meeting. Can you tell us a little bit about the decisions that you made and why you invited um, some of the people that you did? Um, I've been fascinated with the epigenetic work since I first heard Michael Meany talk about um, the, his work with rat pups and their mother's treatment of them. And so uh, I have been to several conferences that focused on genes and behavior, and I've paid particular attention to the speakers on epigenetics. And so I went back through old conference lists and said, oh, that was a great talk, and that was a great talk. Oh, I want to know more about this, and that's how I made my suggestions. Dennis Noble, um, you gave the plenary lecture at yes. the JEB Symposium this year. Can you tell me a little bit about the talk that you gave? Well, first of all, it was a great privilege to come to lecture to this meeting because I've read uh, much of the work of many of the people who are presenting papers on epigenetics and comparative physiology. I've been fascinated by those, but this is the first opportunity I've had to meet some of them and to lecture before them. And, you know, that felt a little bit like Daniel going into the lion's den because they know much more about epigenetics than I do. What I've been doing is looking at the way in which the work that they are doing influences the way in which physiological analysis, that is function in organisms, relates to evolutionary biology. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very privileged time that we live in mm -hmm. because those experiments and the ideas that come from those experiments are leading to some fundamental revisions of the way in which we think about the central theory of biology, which is evolutionary theory, of course. Well, my talk was on uh, locust swarms, and uh, I was telling about whether uh, epigenetics is involved in swarm formation. And how is epigenetics involved in swarm formation? Well, uh, we think it, it is probably the crucial trigger to uh, induce uh, swarms in locusts. And also, you know that uh, locusts, they exist in, in two phenotypes. You have the gregarious form and the solitary form. And uh, the, there, is, uh, there can be switches from one form to another, for instance, from solitarious to gregarious forms. This is caused by uh, the density of the population. And um, when there is lots of tec tactile stimuli, uh, among the, the individual locusts, then the population becomes uh, gregarious. On the other hand, when uh, the gregarious locusts, uh, they can become solitarious, but this takes uh, several generations. And uh, here we think epigenetics uh, comes into play. Well, it was a very uh, general talk. Uh, as I joked at the beginning, it's nice to give talks when you're unencumbered by data. <laughs> And so what I talked about was really some, some theoretical aspects that I think uh, uh, need looking at. We're maybe a little bit, uh, we got a, the cart maybe just a little bit ahead of the horse in terms of collecting data and looking at mechanism and not quite having the, the theoretical framework in which some of these epigenetic effects can be placed. So I talked about our idea of using ants as social insects as a... Uh, emerging model to study epigenetics and in particular its effect on uh, the phenotype of whole organisms 
um, as it pertains uh, behavior, brain function, longevity, those processes that are harder to study in single cells, for example. And how does the, how does the phenomenon of epigenetics influence the social behavior of ants? What's actually going on? Well, that is what we would like to find out, but what we do know is that the different castes in ants have different behaviors, so workers work, and the queen is mostly responsible for reproduction and laying eggs. And uh, what we do know is that, at least in most species, there are no genetic differences between these two individuals. And so we believe that it is epigenetic pathways that control uh, which of the alternative behaviors are put into effect. Um, this meeting has been absolutely fantastic. What I like best about it is that we have people from very, very different areas that don't know each other, that don't know of each other's work. And it's like each talk is a discovery for different people in the audience. I think the long-term consequences will be that uh, people have to think more about including epigenetic hypotheses in their work in, in order to explain certain phenomena that, we, that are important for comparative physiology. Dennis Noble, how do you think that this meeting might influence the future of research in this particular field? Oh, my suggestion would be that people should read the journal because this particular issue of the Journal of Experimental Biology is clearly going to be seminal. It's brought together some of the key players in this area. As I said, it's producing fundamental changes in the way in which evolutionary biology is viewed and can be investigated in the future. If you want to get into this game, you should read this journal. Mm.